Absolutely. <laughs> After that, Philip? Yeah. So uh, I just want to say uh, that I really look forward to being at this meeting and doing this with Frank, whom I have great respect for. I think the election campaign has, uh, has emphasized the importance that all of your councils play in the community, the job and reputation of the South Carolina. Lori's done a great job. Uh, Paula, I was glad to see Jerry Heath, who I've worked here with before. Uh, I saw Jim Fall because I, when I presented the book, uh, I did it in Dallas, I did it in uh, Houston, Linda West, uh, where she had to only turn out 700 people and we sold 300 books before we ran out of books. So uh, it was a great experience. I want to thank our chairman uh, because when I published my first book on energy, it came out as the Harvard Institute, part of the not to say right. But uh, I was just a shy, retiring academic, and this book ends up front page of the New York Times, and they tell me I'm going to go on all these TV shows, and they say that, that I got really nervous and said, well, what am I going to talk about when I go to all these talk shows? They said, it doesn't matter if you talk about them, you just make sure they hold up the book, so. Frank, <laughs> okay, so fine. For those of you who haven't seen the question, right? as Bill Gates said, it's an excellent book. <laughs> So it's actually my pleasure to be here this morning. I've done a number of World Affairs Council venues and discussions. Um, Dan and I go back to the 1990s when I was just a child. Um, and I was with Pennzoil, and we had worked together on the gas, and we've done a number of things. We've done things together as a government. So this is an exceptional, extraordinary opportunity for me. Following Dan Hahnemann's comments about the interconnectivity in the world, um, the U.S. energy policy, global energy policy, I actually think that, that the question is a great stepping off point. Um, any energy nerd in the United States has read the prize, and that was what we grew up with. Um, the quest, a lot of it I've actually lived through, so it actually has more relevance to me. But what strikes me, since a lot of these issues you actually deal with in the book, if you can spend just a couple minutes at the start to talk about main messages and characters, because one of the things Dan does best, as a historian, he has this long-term perspective, but he's also able to recognize emerging issues so early and know that they're going to have relevance, and then take them into a, a conversation with people that they understand. And that's, I think, one of the critical pieces in terms of energy policy and understanding. So in terms of names and characters, so people count to it. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the range of people is quite extraordinary. I learned so much doing this uh, from the professor at Caltech in California who uh, discovered where smog came from. Uh, I think a straight line from that to uh, the electric car you see on a car road. Uh, the man who really launched the modern weight industry, who spent two years a day in 1981, not on a, uh, 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 at a party, but uh, on a wind turbine trying to get it up before midnight because the tax credits were going to run out. <laughs> then it fell down and eventually brought the in. In fact, if you say, where did the modern wind industry came from? You say, Marriage of sturdy Danish agricultural machinery to the California tax credits. That's why we have to read this. Right? <laughs> uh, Admiral Rickover, which was very interesting to me, some of the young people that I work with, I never heard of him, uh, but he's not only the father of uh, uh, nuclear Navy, the nuclear power, and there's a tremendous letter there after the Three Mile Island accident that you can read after any disaster about how disasters happen. Uh, and I would say uh, George P. Mitchell, and people from Texas will know him, was this man for 15 years. You obviously heard a lot about shale gas. For 15 years, he was convinced you could get shale gas out of rock, and the people who worked for him said, George, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money, and it's my money. And so he uh, kept at it, and you know, after 15 years, persistence by one person, breakthrough one, and breakthrough two, and now we are here talking about U.S. energy exports. I'll also say this is the only book on energy, and I'll get to that because these are questions, uh, that you'll ever read uh, about energy that uh, talks about the worst moment in Ronald Reagan's career as an actor. And it's the one of those. Anybody want to know? Uh, he, after his head was green actor, he couldn't get work, and he ended up uh, doing stand up comedy, fronting for a singing group in Las Vegas called Cotton Networks. Thought his career's over, he comes back, phone well, rings, and stage is running, and he has news for him, he has his job. Now you all know, many of you know what the job is, he's a spokesperson for General Electric uh, in 
that contract, by the way, said he would not fly because he said he was going to increase the of people who was afraid of flying. Obviously, the Air Force wanted changes. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, that was when U.S. energy demand was growing at uh, electricity at 10%, it created a lot of challenges. We now see it, and I think you had a mission to China uh, interview there, China and India. The impact of their energy growing at 10% is, uh, has worldwide implications for the field. Uh, I'll just say the three, I think the three big themes, and then we'll go over everyone on energy policy. I mean, you know, you work through a book like this, and you say, well, what's it all about? And uh, I think the first question is this perennial question for you, because it's abundance. Are we going to have enough energy? Are we going to have the right kind of energy? Or are we going to have shortages? Uh, and we've gone through cycles, and, uh, you know, four or five years ago, we were talking about running out of oil. And they say in the book, and that was actually the fifth time the world had run out of oil. First time was in the 1880s when uh, John D. Rockefeller's successor said, I'll drink every barrel of oil in the dying west of the Mississippi. And then Oklahoma, Texas, he rebought that promise uh, through, on it, uh, through the 1970s, which many of you will remember. Um, but we do have this challenge that goes back to the Chinese and Indians. They challenge the energy demand of the world in which the emerging markets are now where the action Growth. So that's the first question. Second is energy security, and I think there, it's the same thing Frank has made a tremendous contribution to what is the traditional issues of the Middle East disruption. Secondly, it's uh, the new, uh, what the former CEO of Sony called the bad new world of cyber vulnerability, and I think really on the agenda, again, CSIS does a lot of work on that. And third, I think Bob Goldbein was happening in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey these issues of how we deal with energy emergencies. Do we just replicate what happens with Katrina and Rita with Sandy, or do we preposition our knowledge so we're prepared to deal with them? So that's the second big set of energy security. And the third is called energy and the environment, but it's really you know, the climate change issue, which began, I asked myself, where did climate change come from? And I thought, you know, right one chapter, I ended up writing six, and it really begins Alps in the 70s, and uh, in the 19th century, the scientists thought, discovered there had been an ice age and were really afraid that another ice age was going to come. Of course, where it is today, you know, all those uh, in uh, Obama's uh, uh, victory speech, uh, he, uh, he, he talked about something else, he talked about during the campaign, much of all climate change, so back on the agenda. So I think those are the three issues that I find really define. Uh, energy issues, and I think so many of the battles that we have in our country about energy are really about two things. One is about privacy, and the other is really the balance between energy and environment. What, whatever you're talking about is kind of what we just have to about. So I think those are the things that define, and I think really define the energy landscape where we are today. That's terrific. But because of this landscape is changing, I actually I'll, I'll focus on both of those. So on um, the first issue, it strikes me that for the last 40 years, our policy has been predicated, especially on the oil side, and Dan kind of alluded to this. Resource scarcity is growing thing. In our place, we're on the oil side, we're looking at flat air climate again, we have this enormous resource. But the dilemma is, in terms of the climate piece, if we perpetuate a fossil fuel future, how does that run the greenhouse gas emissions targets? So, how do you find that space? I think that what we've seen, that of course, the U.S. has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions much more than the Europeans. And one, I mean, besides the recession downturn, is because of gas emissions hold up. I don't know if Dan spoke about that in particular, but it's quite striking uh, how quickly that's going. And so, in the short and medium term, I think that part of the argument about shale gas is that, you know, I think the industry reaction to it was, well, it is a fossil fuel uh, And, you know, but I think the other things, like the job creation impact, you know, if you take the unconventional oil and gas together, uh, you know, I would say last week, we created something like 1.8 million jobs in the last few years, big numbers. So there, that's why you kind of get these trade-offs. But there is a different uh, view. We can still become more efficient in how we use energy, but if more of the barrels are produced here, <coughs> not in Venezuela or in some other country, uh, what happened? we get the security benefits. And the other thing, which I think, underestimated, 
I think had a big impact. You may have heard from Dan, who's the thinking administration. Is people didn't think until a year, year and a half ago about the long supply chains and what it meant for economic development, the job creation, the competitive the United States for viable manufacturers. And I, I don't think it was until probably the NPC study that you were part of and the study that we did uh, for Secretary Chu on, uh, on, green, uh, on, on environmental aspects of shale gas until you know, basically a year ago, September, that people really focused on that. So I think that's going to be quite large. And the international implications. I, Dan didn't talk about it in the sanctions, which is of interest, obviously, to the audience. The U.S. production in liquids has gone up over 700,000 tons a day in the last couple of years. Um, and, and that's largely been able to help with additional soil production, the, the sanctions be effective. But there's broader implications, and we talked about that in the book as well. What is this resurgence in the U.S. oil and gas in the state of oil? Well, it's something that we've talked a lot about. Um, you know, we don't import that much oil now in the Middle East. I remember during the 2008 campaign talking to one of the Democratic candidates who was under the impression of all of our oil imports came from the Middle East, obviously uh, by far the largest countries from Canada. But I think what you can envision is between what's happening in oil here, the growth of oil sands in Canada, Brazilian offshore, what's called pre salt some in this room are concerned if they do it in the right way, uh, that um, you will see what I call a rebalancing of global oil, in which the Western Hemisphere will eventually have a little reason to import oil in the Eastern Hemisphere. And that raises a very interesting strategic question for everybody. But it means more of those tankers will be going through the Strait of Hormuz instead of turning right, they'll be turning left and going to Asia. And so, you know, one question is, is China feel comfortable continuing to rely upon the U.S. Navy as opposed to sea lanes? As, um, you know, nobody's been a bigger beneficiary of the U.S. Navy than the Chinese, actually, in terms of their economic development. So if you could stay in that team for a second, because I think this energy independence has been um, misinterpreted and misused by a lot of people. This notion of that the United States is going to cede the Middle East to Asia, um, that the Japanese would be concerned that we don't have on the Middle East, that we, they don't need a fleet. We don't need to keep a tank of traffic open, routes open. Uh, even the Europeans were the uh, the United States. I think we're sending, in a lot of ways, the wrong message. Yeah, because I think we'll still, uh, next year, we'll still be engaged there. We'll still think what happens in the Middle East is very, very important. Uh, so, but I think we'll see maybe a shift, you know, as a people are arguing over budgets in the next several years. It will be sort of what is the level of commitment and, and who would we like to share the, those words with. I think it's a very interesting question, not least for us, but actually in particular for the Chinese as we look at the uh, development of, uh, of, uh, of their okay. So you're known for kind of the historical kind of perspectives. Look forward to this. I'm Secretary Hughes, Energy Advisory Panel, and we now have a second term in the Obama administration. What are the big issues they have? Well, I think one big issue is uh, the logistics of this new supply, the infrastructure, um, the pipelines, and uh, uh, is it Keystone XL? Uh, no, not in that context. Uh, I think everybody, I, I think Keystone XL is the most famous oil pipeline in American history because it hasn't been built. So. <laughs> I think the signal was that after the administration kind of for a year. About two months later, President Obama was photographed smiling in front of very large pipes in Cushing, Oklahoma, that will be part of the southern lake of Keystone XL. So I assume that will be built. Uh, but I think that it did have a big impact on the Canadian use of that, you know, maybe we should not just be dependent on one part of the United States and we should look west uh, towards Asia uh, as well. But sort of getting the whole pipeline system connecting the East Coast to what's happening in North Dakota, second largest oil producing state in the country right now. Uh, I think another big issue we're going to see a debate uh, with and uh, the changing composition of the Senate Energy Committee is the uh, export of U.S. energy, uh, in particular uh, the export of natural gas. And, you know, we were here five years ago, one could have had a map showing all these terminals in the U.S. where we would have been 
importing liquefied natural gas, gasifying and getting back in the system. Now we're starting to see maps <coughs> the export on it. And um, I was just in Japan and spent uh, a time talking to the Japanese about their nuclear program and what they could do. It seems to me that it's very hard to tell the Japanese, don't import oil from Iran. We just had this incredible tragedy, very closely aligned with us. It would be prudent for us to be uh, an exporter of some modest amount of energy in that direction. Because as we maybe have a surplus, our markets determined now by demand, not by supply. But I think we'll see some big fights about that. And hearing about that already. And then the question about how to come back. Yeah, so it's crept in bottom up rather than top down. Yeah. Um, Japan, so nuclear as a result of Fukushima, uh, uh, demand for oil and gas, especially in a tight and increasingly expensive market, they have to be evaluated. Right. Yeah, the Japanese government, contrary to what you read, has not said they're going to end nuclear power in the 2030s. Rather, what they said is they want to develop the capabilities or the capacity that if they choose to power of the power. And I think I've just been in this morning with the and so the same way I did that the act of Fukushima was not only an indictment of the power, but it was an indictment of the system of governments and societal organization and uh, involving private industry, government uh, regulation that was not done the right way. And so it's been a more searching struggle and it was an awful thing. That happened then. You know, you see the demonstration every Friday in front of the Prime Minister's uh, on office. But you know, you, the, but the Japanese are also sort of saying, well, wait, they don't want to have a high energy cost in the world. Uh, if we're going to continue to lose competitiveness. We're going to hollow out our industry. What about diversification, energy security? So one gets the impression is that they're inching their way towards a reduced reliance. Maybe I don't know if this is what you pick up too, Frank. Maybe said that there were 30% or 50% electricity, maybe 15%. And they're going to put money into renewables and see, even though Japan is not very well situated for renewables, see what they can do in terms of technology to uh, diversify their electricity for the public. Definitely not. So while I could talk to Dan for the rest of the afternoon, and that would be very fun to so, um, I've been told that we ought to open up questions to the audience. So please. Oh, there's a microphone. I have a couple of questions. My name is James Nathan from Alabama. Uh, I have a couple of questions about uh, LNG. Uh, one is pipeline security. I've been told that the pipeline structure is 50 years old, in large part, and hasn't been, hasn't, doesn't have the kind of uh, regulatory oversight that, that one would like. The second issue is, uh, is the use of LNG in vehicles. If I lived in Australia, the way you did was quite common, and that was 30 years ago. I don't see what the issue is with work pipelines and distributors, but the issue is really of why not having a vehicle or a fleet just for people uh, who wanted to know the chain. Well, I think, um, you know, if you think about, let me take your second question first. If you think about what we've seen the last 10, let's see, yeah, if you just take the last decade, first we're going to have hydrogen vehicles. That was going to be biofuels, electric cars, not natural gas. But there is a shift in the supply. And it does seem that some part of our kind of fleet operations is going to be moved to the LNG with these prices towards using natural gas, which is just natural gas, and long distance fleets, the trucks. I, you know, it's always a question what kind of cars are you all going to drive? We all have been driving 10 years. Uh, I don't think too many of our private cars. Also, because our cars are a lot more energy efficient, so 54 miles per gallon for natural gas to be the cost of the extra infrastructure, uh, I think, makes that more problematic, at least at this point, I would say. Um, the pipelines, it is, you know, the pipeline system is regulated, and we know there was one bad pipeline accident in uh, San Bruno, California. Uh, which I guess is still being investigated. Uh, but generally, we have a you know, network that uses a lot of gas around. I don't know if 
No, I'm not going to skip the place. Right? So there is testing um, or pressure testing that goes on. Uh, the sequencing of the testing and maintenance, I think, has been an issue in the last several years, especially in the low no pressure mines. But as public scrutiny increases, it's going to be more visual. I just want to point out the CNG and LNG. I, Dan talked about the, the fleet, but the energy content right now of gasoline is portable, it's storable, and it's you know, eight or ten times better than natural gas. In terms of the number of cars, it's hard to understand. And if you get a 60 mile to the gallon car with gasoline hybrid, <coughs> other than in the certain. So we had Secretary Chin speak at our conference in Houston a couple of years ago. He surprised everybody by saying, you know, oil, gasoline, that's an incredible tactic of energy right there. Yeah. Oil sands is seen as uh, dirty oil. Do you see technology looking after that in time <coughs> so that it will remain a viable source of such a large reserve? Yeah, I think uh, oil sands, uh, kind of otherwise known as tar sand, depending on how you feel about it, oil sand. <laughs> <laughs> I have a colleague who says tar is an enemy, so I simply can't call it that. Uh, I think it's a great resource. Uh, it's, the output of the oil sands is greater now than Libya's production before the revolution. For the Civil War, so it's a, it's a big deal, a big thing for security. Um, and I think that um, the carbon footprint has been exaggerated because you have to look at it as a well to real services, uh, or a well to tailpipe. And if you, most of the CO2 is actually emitted in your engine of your automobile. So, you know, it's probably somewhere between 10 to 15 percent more CO2, it's not the 40 or 50 percent. And I think that the, and I think that the companies there have every incentive to, to reduce the carbon footprint and put the effort into it. So um, I think it's a important resource. And by the way, we use a number of other grades of oil, both imported and produced in the United States, that have the same level of carbon footprint. So I think it's been a target because it gives great photo opportunities. And that's switching to the oil from, from the strip mining to make six years of that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lisa Falsman, the CEO of the Alaska World Affairs Council. And an area important to us is the Arctic, of course, with the melting sea ice and all the energy potential that, that is seen under this melting sea ice. And, and we see a lot of fleets coming in and interest by Arctic countries like Russia and Iceland and Norway, and even China with, with a lot of interest, even though we don't believe they're in the Arctic, but they might. Yeah, they claim to have the U.S. and how that they're an Arctic country. They are, and they're there. What we don't see is we don't see U.S. fleets, and you know, given that Alaska is part of the U.S., and so the U.S. is an Arctic country, what do you see as potential for energy in the Arctic and U.S.'s role in trying to claim or stake out and, and, and explore some of these resources? Well, I guess there's the Arctic Council is meant to sort it out, and obviously the Arctic, Alaska, is part of that development going on. Now, the two countries, I mean, I think, I think number of, like 30 percent of the resources like that is thought to be in the Arctic region and now more accessible. Two countries with the biggest positions are you know, Canada and Russia. And I think Russia has decided that it can't just continue to live off its Soviet legacy of West Siberia. And so it signed these very large deals with Western companies, including uh, ExxonMobil, uh, to develop the Arctic, but it will take 20 or 25 years to, I mean, a very long lead time to really get into production. But I think um, uh, it's seen as a frontier area, and new technologies will have to be developed for some of the areas that they want to work in. Um, I, it is said that we're hindered to some degree by our participation by not well, this is, this is, this is, this is, this actually give us more standing up. And Ash Carter had been here for lunch. Book have said that from the defense perspective, it's a matter of national security. We need to spend all money on the last two large spring ice cream. And have that part of it. Um, Alan Livingston from Houston. Um, second thought, I spoke with Linda this morning, and I told her you were attending the conference, and she said to tell you hello. Um, my question is that a lot of the dry gas that is associated with resource plays now is not being developed as rapidly because of the low wellhead price. 
uh, in many areas, most of the drilling is being directed where there's a high liquid content of the gas. What kind of uh, pricing uh, uh, stage would you say is necessary to re-stimulate the development of the dry gas resource place? Right. You know, for those who don't follow this, explain what gas and dry gas, uh, what gas will have with the liquid, basically oil, oil-like uh, liquids in it. And so even if gas prices are low, you make money because uh, the oil prices is, is so much higher. And so if you're just producing natural gas until the last two weeks, you're selling to the press market. Uh, you know, we use sort of a price, sort of price, sort of a a volatile price around $4 to keep the gas business going. And, you know, the, the market responds very quickly in terms of the rates going up and down uh, to what the price is. So I think, you know, we're not too far from $4 now, so I think certainly the dry gas is going to be pricey for uh, really better. But, you know, it's amazing how quickly markets can move and uh, what seems to be the right strategy one year and next year leaves you under financial pressure. Sponsors. Uh, I was interested to hear you talk about nuclear, and I wonder, um, Duke Energy is building the uh, first nuclear plant in the United States since, what, the 1970s? I wonder if you would talk a little bit about why nuclear is a moral solution as well. Is it just the fear of, you know, the rest of the not only in Fukushima, but for the island? I think it's awesome. I mean, it's really, uh, if you're a utility executive, I think the two projects are um, in South Carolina and uh, Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, uh, the two projects. But that is done under legislation where there are some protections. If the federal government just made economic protections, including in the sense ensuring uh, you against regulatory changes, the government ensuring you against changes by the government to add drive your costs. And they're only willing to do that for two projects. So those are the ones they got going. And I think they got going before the economics. The thing that's out there, the thing that's changing the marketplace of electric power is inexpensive natural gas. And whether you're a coal producer, coal consumption is going down, so they're exporting coal to China. Uh, uh, nuclear, wind, renewables, they're all dealing with this competitive juggernaut called low cost natural gas. And then the cost of nuclear, nuclear is expensive. I mean, and it takes a long time to build. You can build natural gas much more quickly. The regulatory process just goes on and on. So I think it's just uh, companies just saying we can't. Uh, the financial commitment against it is too great, and we'll manage our demand by using renewables under state mandates and balance that out with natural gas rather than trying to build based on plants. Now, one subject of the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board is going to be the subject of small, small modules of SDS, SNRs, that's what this is the initial, um, that uh, would be, in effect, sort of like assembled the factories and then uh, to try and standardize the production and bring down the cost. So I don't know if you have a view of those, right? So the SMRs are basically, if you take your submarine technology, Put this on a truck, it's 300 megawatts, and bring it into the very at once. We don't have to do a gigawatt, which is not nearly, it's, it's so much more expensive. And for developing countries, and maybe for some of these advanced rights, it's been natural gas, it's been Fukushima, and it's also been, I think, the fact that we have a lot of land, and a lot of So now we have a competition between renewables, natural gas, coal, and yeah. For a market that is, is growing very slowly, rather than if we were a kid. Ronald Reagan's America, when you look at GE at 10% or in China, you know, you would look at it at a different kind of thing. So full circle, we start with Ronald Reagan and that's fine. Right? <laughs> so the end will be available on those over there. Okay. Um, if you'll thank me, join me in thanking Dan.